This week's episode is sponsored by TaxJar. You really need to make data-driven decisions like, for example, like if you look on Twitter, which is like a free channel, and you can kind of see, take a gauge of, or do analysis of like what people are saying on Twitter about your product or what people, maybe about that category or something. And how does that relate to what you've learned there? How does that relate to the strategies you're using on one of your paid channels? You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. Marketplaces, media networks, social commerce. What do all of these things have in common? They need good content. Now, you all know me by now. I'm the VP of content for Retail Touchpoint, so anything involving content, I am there. So that's why I knew I had to sit down with Greg Ives and Bradley Hearn of Channel Advisor because they wanted to dig into the new rules and requirements of content in the omni-channel customer experience. And you'll find, sure, we talk about, you know, the high-level stuff like new customer behaviors, the evolution of digital and buy online, pick up in store, but we quickly get deep into why content is more important than ever and what makes good content and what needs to be done at a foundational below the hood level, so to speak, to ensure that this content performs as well as it could. It's a really interesting conversation, and I've always known content is important in driving the customer experience, but as we think of how all of these new channels and possible outlets for commerce emerge, and they all start to blend together, content is playing an increasingly important role. So listen in. Definitely have your notebook ready because there are definitely going to be some key takeaways and action items for you to apply. Greg, Bradley, thank you so much for taking the time out to speak with me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. So to start, I would love for you guys just to share a little bit about your respective roles at Channel Advisor. What does your day-to-day currently look like? Yeah, so we work on the product marketing team. Greg leads our team globally. And as product marketers, we we work with on a day-to-day basis. No day looks the same. I mean, we work tons, tons of different teams, product to services, AMs, engineering, tons of others, depending on the day and depending on the project. But basically, we help control the positioning of Channel Advisors' evolving suite of products, both publicly and internally. So like Bradley mentioned, I lead the product marketing team at Channel Advisor, and that really includes sort of a mix on a day-to-day basis of go-to-market, sales enablement, content generation, product intelligence, you name it. So love that every day is a little something different. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sure in your day-to-day, just speaking and working with brands and retailers, you've been hearing a lot about what I've been hearing, which is how the consumer has changed and how they need to adapt and evolve in light of these changes. I know even as I just look at my own behaviors, right? Like I see notable shifts in how I think about shopping, the outlets I use, where I even start the decision-making process, things of that nature. But I'm curious, again, because you work with so many different types of companies, what are you hearing from your clients? How are they seeing these customer shifts? What's really rising to the top for them? Yeah, it's interesting to work in like retail and e-commerce, like you said, because like we're all consumers. Like we're all, we can all resonate with what we're doing at our work because it's also part of our personal life. Or we're constantly, we're all consumers at all times, whether we're in an active or kind of latent state of being a consumer. But with that said, I mean, yeah, consumer behavior is definitely evolving for sure. I mean, that's not really news to anyone. We or they, consumers, um, just have more options now, more options, better options. And with that, our expectations around shopping and around that experience are just are evolving. And you can kind of trace it all back to even to Amazon. Amazon just perfected this e-commerce experience with you know endless choice, fast, secure checkout, speedy delivery. And then everyone, everyone collectively was like, yeah, this is what we want. Everyone should do this. And so everyone had to sort of catch up about what to what Amazon was doing. A model is kind of everywhere and expanding. It wasn't just Amazon. I mean, there were some other marketplaces doing that, but Amazon really took the lead and became the sort of global behemoth that they did because of the experience that they created. 
And so now we as consumers expect convenience and a seamless experience across hundreds of different touch points. We expect that everywhere we go. And so sellers and channels themselves are having to adapt to try to keep up. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of chicken and egg situation, you know, which came first, like all this uh, industry change and technology change or the consumer behavior drive it. And it's really kind of both, like both of them are sort of fueling each other and propelling the industry forward. Like consumer behavior is, yes, getting more evolving and, and consumers are getting more demanding and creating that change, like driving that change. But also new technology and new channels are also heightening the stakes as well. So they're just kind of fueling each other and propelling each other forward. And that those changes were in motion anyway, as we saw, uh, but the pandemic just sort of lit a match to all of that and just accelerated everything, all those changes and all those patterns ahead the past several years. The main one being just the willingness to shop online that got sped up. I, I think about my parents and like that whole generation are now more comfortable purchasing online because they had to, you know, we actually at Channel Advisor, we conducted several surveys, but we did one most recently last August with the global firm Dynata, just trying to get a grasp on how the pandemic was affecting consumer behavior. And we found, I mean, basically what you'd expect, that people were shopping online more. They were purchasing from items that they had never bought before online. And as a result, they were growing more comfortable shopping online. And then naturally with that, a large majority of them said that actually 52% of U.S. shoppers, I think it was, said that they'll shop online more than they would in the future than before the pandemic. So, yeah, I mean, behavior is forever changed and it just got sped up by a few years. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. In fact, I can just look at, you mentioned parents. My parents, they had never shopped online. I know as crazy as that sounds, they'd never shopped online until they were forced to a little over two years ago, right? And so that it's been interesting to see how quickly they've been kind of pulled into this and pushed forward. And now they're really comfortable with this change in behavior, right? It's become almost commonplace and, and they recognize that comfort, right? One of the big aspects, and this is something that doesn't just apply to my parents, but I would say the majority of folks is the, the rise of Opus, right? So like the buy online, pick up in store, hate that name, by the way, never Terrible been a fan. Terrible <laughs> it, it really, it's just, it's just awkward sounding. I do prefer to click and collect, but we're, you know, just what we call curbside pickup a lot of the times. That's something that has absolutely changed. My household, we see from a survey that we, you know, the Channel Advisor did back in August that half of consumers say that they are using Click and Collect or Bopus now since the pandemic uh, began. And that's one of those that I just don't see going back. I don't think that that's a behavior that people are going to want to let go of, right? Because it is just so easy. I can place an order on my phone and 15 minutes later, go pick up, whether it's groceries or a meal, don't even have to, to really you know, get too dressed up and, and just go meet them by the curbside and, and take it home. It's just, it's super simple. So I do think that that is going to be one of those results that kind of sticks around. Yeah. And that's tied directly to the convenience. Like people get a taste of like a more convenient way of like buying and receiving their products and then it's not going to go away. Like they, they expect that as now the new standard and only to improve. Yeah. I'm really glad you, you brought up these new standards plus the standards of these new online shoppers, right? Because they're completely new to this. They have no idea what to expect in some cases, like how to navigate everything. But once they do get a taste, so to speak, of that seamlessness and how intuitive everything is. I mean, in some cases, things may not be as intuitive, which could present some challenges or opportunities for improvement on the retailer side. But also earlier in your response, of course, Amazon came up, which has always been a significant benchmark, I think, for a lot of brands and retailers of like, how can we improve this experience? Maybe not be Amazon, but employ some of the differentiators or what makes that brand experience shine. So it seems like pressures are coming from two different sources in a way. It's the competition or, you know, the peers in the retail community that are dictating what is best in class as well as consumers who are also dictating what's best in class, right? Like they have their own needs and expectations. Are there any particular like pain points or I guess more granular challenges that are coming up in your conversations with retailers? Like is it around engagement? Is it around like creating that streamlined purchase experience? Is it around delivering upon fulfillment? I mean, I'm sure this is like 
snowballing into like a 10 hour conversation. <laughs> so I guess trying to identify like the top one or two maybe issues that have come up. Sure. I can touch on definitely the ones that our brands are seeing most often, right? So like you said, it's uh, chicken or the egg. The consumer's driving it. Then you have the channels responding, not just Amazon. You have other major marketplaces and retailers out there who are sort of following that lead, but are making just as much noise and and fighting for uh, for these brands and, and these sellers. And what's happening is you have this e-commerce universe, right, of marketplaces, of, of, of sellers, of fulfillment partners, logistics providers, you name it. They're all competing now for a brand's attention. Well, most brands, unfortunately, big or small, they're not typically set up well logistically or internally to accommodate this rapid channel expansion that we're seeing, right? They might have had a team for, let's say, eBay, and they might have had a team for Amazon or for Walmart. But all of a sudden, now you got all these long tail marketplaces and, and retail sites, and they all have different, for instance, integration requirements. They have different data specifications you have to follow. You have to worry about your product content being accepted across all of these new channels. You have to think about keeping your pricing, your inventory synchronized. Obviously, with all of these new channels, there's competition, right? And so how do you get seen? How do you keep your products at the forefront when consumer, potential consumer, arrives at the site, right? And then we just touched on the crazy fulfillment demands, right, that customers have just become accustomed to. Same day delivery, curbside delivery, you name it, it's just speeding up and more and more options. So like I said, I mean, brands are really struggling with this. This isn't just small brands either. I mean, the, they're having a hard time keeping up with this just boom, right? Absolutely. And actually, in brands, you mentioned, so we work with brands and retailers and brands themselves have another Another like layer of challenges on top of all those other challenges that you just mentioned, because uh, and that is maintaining relationships with their retailers. So like, as a quick definition, most people in the industry call a brand. A brand is a company that actually makes its own products. And some of those those brands act as their own retailers and they sell directly to consumers, either on their website or through marketplaces. But many brands don't bother selling directly to consumers. They will sell in bulk, you know, as a first party to retailers like an Amazon could be a retailer. And then some brands kind of adopt a, a hybrid approach, selling some products directly and then others through retailers, rely on the retailer to like, you know, list, sell and fulfill it for them. So they don't have to worry about it. But then all three of those business models, direct, indirect or hybrid, they have their own challenges too. Like the ones that Greg mentioned, but also making sure that your retailers are upholding their end of the deal. Are they pricing your products right? Are they maintaining the brand image that you want? If you try to dip your toes into the water of selling direct, are you are you stepping on the toes of your retailers? How do your products look on their sites? Are you undercutting them on price? Are they undercutting you on price? And there's a lot of like relationship stuff between brands and retailers that just adds another kind of layer of complexity to it as well. So yeah, like you said, we could talk about it for 10 hours about all the stuff that, all the challenges out there in the industry, but um yeah, it's yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, <laughs> right. that should have been the answer. <laughs> I think I think I found the title of this episode. <laughs> it's complicated. <Yeah. laughs> So uh, to the end, I mean, let, let's try and break this down and, and streamline it a little bit. Let's think about like the new channels or, or new methods for reaching consumers. I think when we think about marketplaces in particular, like that's very interesting because brands are selling through marketplaces. They have like their marketplace strategy. Now we're seeing retailers become marketplaces and they are kind of developing their own revenue models like the the once very streamlined ecosystem or very to the point ecosystem is becoming increasingly complex. Then we have social commerce, which is another avenue or way for both brands and retailers to drive that revenue and drive that long-term engagement. And then of course, it's like that direct e-commerce experience. It seems like there are like core pillars that are emerging, right? Like as we think about these different commerce moments, I guess, for lack of a better Word. So to that end, this expanding ecosystem, each have their own parameters, possibly best practices, things that need to be done for these models or experiences to be sound, right? Like the point around accurate and compelling product information and content comes up quite a bit. So I'm glad that came up. So with that, you know, as we think about like the customer journey, the customer experience, there are a lot of different paths and roads that the consumer can take. So from the retailers and brands perspective, I mean, how are they thinking about all of this? How are they thinking about the customer journey and the customer experience? Because 
I know historically it's always been about like the funnel, right? Like awareness, like that's the biggest pool. And then you slowly narrow it down, you nurture them, and then we get conversion or purchase at the bottom. Because there are so many new outlets for not just buying, but discovery, community, you know, engaging with other people. Does this like funnel model still make sense? I mean, how are you encouraging your customers to kind of think about the customer journey, the customer experience, especially because it seems like there needs to be more of an emphasis on that long-term engagement and loyalty creation right now? Yeah, so I'll take this one. I do think in certain situations, it's helpful for a brand to still think about this in a linear fashion. So a funnel is still applicable. It's easy to kind of identify the different phases and how you should be applying your strategy to each phase. Everything from, like you said, like awareness, consideration, conversion. But I think that that works well for the customer acquisition side, right? So new customers and developing your strategy around that. However, I do think that there's a second model that sort of emerged over the last few years, especially in response to all these different touch points. And that would be more of a flywheel, right? You want to aim for the customer retention or the loyalty, you know, aspect of this. You know, instead of just one-time customers, how do you use all of these touch points? You know, we're talking about social or custom video content, reward programs, I mean, all this stuff that the major brands and retailers are, are spending a lot of money on in order to retain these customers. Because I mean, as we all know, it's cheaper to retain than go out and discover new. So I would actually say that in that sense, a flywheel model would probably be better than a, in terms of sustainable growth, than a funnel, right? You can still follow in a linear fashion sort of around that flywheel, but it's really just about, okay, what did you learn from that funnel experience? How can you nurture these long-term engagements and these relationships that you're building and then improve on it for next time. So I think that that would be the really the big shift, right, in the way that we think about the journey. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with all that. Yeah, like a flywheel is, is probably a more appropriate model. But if you're thinking about just the beginning part, just the customer acquisition, finally attracting that customer for the first time, I mean, the biggest underlying challenge is what you, I guess, alluded to, Alicia. Like, it's just everyone is just on different channels doing different things, like all over the internet. Uh, and we're more siloed than we ever have been before. We want, if you're thinking about the top of the funnel, you're talking about marketing. Like, as marketers, you want to put the right product in front of the right consumer at just the right time. But unfortunately, it just it doesn't work. Like, it doesn't work that way anymore. So it's not that easy. Like, think about back in the day, like even like Mad Men era or like advertising pre internet. Like you took a new product, you came up with like a catchy and effective way to market it, or talk about it, and you blasted that story to the masses. And it usually worked. But here we are now, the internet, this medium that was supposed to connect everybody in theory, but really all it did was fragment us into a million different little pages and sites and channels just doing different stuff. So it's tough when you're trying to meet, reach a mass audience with your product. You can't just hope and pray that the entire internet shows up on your website or your, your product page. So... Another model that we um, we encourage is to not get overwhelmed thinking about this channel and that channel. I got to be on a thousand channels. Yeah, you need to refine your strategies across all these channels, but you should restructure your thinking not by channel, but around that funnel, around your consumer. More specifically, there what's their intent at each stage of the funnel? That buyer's intent is the funnel because it's it's a psychological journey. It's a mindset. Like their digital touch point journey is all over the place. It might be 50 or 60 different touch points and blah, 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 here and there, here and there. But like that psychological intent is always going to be the same. It's the same for every single consumer. Always has been, always will be. They become aware of something, they consider it, they buy it, and then they, become, uh, they may or may not become loyal. And unfortunately, there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. For every brand or retailer, it really just depends on your product or everything. Greg and I were, are always talking about the different stuff that we buy and the consumer journeys that we go on. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they're five minutes long and sometimes they're, Greg's really into astronomy and um, he'll spend eight months researching a telescope before he actually buys one. Yeah, there's just different, different journeys for every, every consumer. So you got to think about who your consumer is for your product and construct their funnel like based on, based on that, on kind of what, what their intent is. 
I think that's a really good point because anytime I'm speaking with someone about content or marketing strategy, like how to nail like creative, for instance, and they say, well, how do we do this? And I'm like, well, it kind of depends, right? And then you kind of get into the follow-up questions because then you don't want to be giving like a non-answer, right? So I'm going to kind of put you on the spot a little bit because I love your point around how it isn't one size fits all. It, it should be built around the consumer. So to that end, there are the earned channels, there are the owned channels, which of course is like the e-commerce site, you know, the brand's email list, it's the brand's blog, you know, whatever is kind of owned by them. But then there are like the rented channels too, right? Like social media. And I keep thinking about when Instagram went down and all of the marketers like panicked, (laughs) (laughs) like went into a frenzy. And it accelerated a really interesting conversation about being mindful of how much time and effort you spend on rented land, so to speak. And if you are using those channels, are you creating a seamless connecting point to your own channels? Like you were talking about like, oh, you can't just like expect someone to discover your product on the landing page, right? Like there has to be like a path there. So what do you kind of recommend as far as like helping brands and retailers balance that owned versus rented platform strategy effectively. And again, I know it's not one size fits all, but are there any parameters maybe that like you say, like, okay, consider X, Y, Z, especially as content becomes more key in this journey? Yeah. Well, yeah, it depends. Yeah, it definitely depends. I mean, first of all, like a lot of these lines between those, you know, whether it's owned, earned or purchased or rented, whatever channels, uh, the lines are blurring. Those lines don't matter to consumers. So they should matter less and less to you. Consumers just want a consistent experience across all channels. So it's really important for like brands and retailers. Like agility has to be like a core part of your business. And like you have to be have a consistency and a seamlessness across all those channels, first of all. Well, second, everything needs to be data driven. And that's such a nerdy, a cliched way to uh, answer to that. But like you really need to make data driven decisions. Like, for example, like if you look on Twitter, which is like a free channel, and you can kind of see, take a gauge of or do analysis of like what people are saying on Twitter about your product or what people maybe about that category or something. And how does that relate to what you've learned there? How does that relate to the strategies you're using on one of your paid channels? You know, informing what people are talking about, maybe the terms they're using to talk about it and using that to maybe bid up on terms on another channel, like marketing or how you create a commercial or how you just different things, use like leveraging data from one channel to inform the other. And the same thing, TikTok. I mean, I don't even understand TikTok. Uh, <laughs> I'm not on it. I'm with you. I know I'm working on it. It's a bigger, bigger deal every day. And so like people are generating like review content on there, like lots of it, like lots of review content. So monitor that. I mean, is there something that applies to your products? Are they people reviewing your stuff? If it's a good review and depending on the person or their following, whatever, you can boost it. I heard something about something called Spark Ads recently. Leverage influencers if you can. Like there's there's ways to leverage each channel that and sort of informs all of them. So you can have sort of, you need a holistic approach basically. Yeah. And actually add to this in recent years, just over the last two or three years, I do think there's sort of this great unifier across this sort of this owned and rented or paid kind of realms that we operate across of. And that's shuffle media. Okay. And it's a fairly newer term. It's something that we've really been paying a lot of attention to, especially over the last few years, just to kind of level set for listeners, because different solutions will call shoppable media different things. But the easiest way to think about it is, and what we call shoppable media, is that sort of that layer of technology that you can apply, right, to any of your digital campaigns, any of your content, even your website, to make them actionable or like shoppable. <laughs> and so that can take on many forms. It's anywhere that you can embed a link, for instance, we talked about Bopus before, that where to buy aspect that brands have on their site, that owned media they have when customers are looking for more information about their products. You want to make sure that you're able to ease that path to purchase, right? And provide an actionable experience there with that, whether it's Bopus or buy online. You can also incorporate this like sort of this new technology, like dynamic linking, 
that helps mitigate any sort of out-of-stock products, which is incredibly helpful, especially in this world of supply chain issues that we're living in right now. It's just incredibly powerful. So basically, the easiest way to think about this is like anywhere that you can embed a piece of digital content or anywhere that you can embed a link and a piece of content, you know, that has now become actionable, which is pretty amazing, right? I mean, that's opening the door for not just social commerce, not just display ads, but QR codes, email, video, you name it. Anywhere that you can embed a link now, you can make that jump, right? To make it just as impactful across the board, whether you're paying for it or not. Yep. Everything is shoppable. Yeah, that's huge. Wow. Really interesting. Yeah. Because I know like the one challenge that like I've always seen with some social media strategy. Sometimes the content is super beautiful. Sometimes like products aren't tagged though, or there are no direct links. So it creates that dead end for the consumer, right? So like they have that inspiration and then it's like, okay, well, what now? So I think this whole idea of like shoppable content and creating that seamless tie from like inspiration to conversion is huge. That's exactly right. You're shortening that funnel. And then the fact that you can insert backup products or like a backup retailer if something is out of stock, I mean, that just takes it to another level. I mean, you're not losing the customer. Once they are, once they show interest, they click, you're taking them right to the point of purchase. Yeah, you had them. Like the last thing you want is for that, that interested consumer to go back out on the internet only to get distracted by any number of things, including your competitors. Greg, going to your point around things being out of stock, I think my one biggest gripe with like social advertising and like sometimes the creative is beautiful. Sometimes the products are like really relevant to like my tastes and my preferences, which is great, but I'll click on it and it's out of stock. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, can't you like, I know like it's some, sometimes it feels like the pieces aren't fully connected yet. It's like they are, but they aren't. So I think providing alternatives or linking to another retailer. Like that's a really powerful way to create a detour, so to speak, to keep that customer on that journey rather than just being frustrated and not wanting to engage anymore. Absolutely. The dynamic linking technology, I mean, that really takes it to another level. And I would expect to see this definitely become sort of more entrenched in, in bigger and, and broader type of campaigns outside of just what typically has been applied to social and maybe to a, a brand's website, right? You know, you have that old school where to buy thinking, but it's basically taking that, that approach and applying it to any digital content. So pretty powerful stuff. From marketplaces to social selling, the opportunities for e-commerce retailers to grow their business has never been better. But selling on more platforms and in more regions means increasingly complex sales tax requirements. TaxChart automates the entire sales tax compliance lifecycle for retailers, including real-time calculations, multi-channel reporting, nexus calculations, and automated filling. They simplify your sales tax so you can focus on the important stuff, like developing great products and attracting customers. Visit TaxJar.com to learn how we can help. So, I mean, is there an opportunity there, like, as we start to think about, like, retail media? I mean, I think everyone is pretty much clear on, like, the opportunities for both brands and retailers here and, like, why this is becoming such a big topic. But, I mean... What are some of the challenges that are kind of emerging with this model as it begins to accelerate, for lack of a better word, and more retailers are starting to implement these models? Like, what are the challenges here? Is it that bit of a disconnect? And is this technology going to help solve it? It is definitely, um, <laughs> as you say, it's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know where to begin. I mean, because, well, retail media, yeah, as you said, I mean, it is not going anywhere. It is, retail media is going to, I think it's going to expand a lot this year and the years to come. It is just growing crazy. I think Greg and I were talking recently, I think Amazon just announced that they had a 31 billion in ad sales. I think we were like 32%. Yeah. I got that is insane. Yeah, that was the headline in their earnings, right? Yeah. Like that's what everyone was exactly. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, so of course, other channels want a piece of that action. You know, like Walmart and eBay in recent years have like really beefed up their advertising programs, but you're just going to start seeing it everywhere across retail sites. I mean, you know, all the targets of the world, but also like into like Walgreens and like Home Depot, right? all these retail sites, you're going to just deal with ads because people are okay with them. I think at first people were scared that, you know, you fill your site with ads, then people are going to hate it. But clearly that's not happening. Yeah, I don't see a retail sector that's immune to this. I mean, this is something that there's just there's too much at risk. There's it's a win for the the sites to keep 
traffic on the site. It's a win from the fact that we see the the ad revenue. And then it's a win for the brands who are able to protect their brand on the site when, when customers are searching for a product. And, and it's a way to, to boost visibility. I mean, it, there's really... And apparently, I mean, customers don't have a problem with it, right? But as far as challenges, I mean, for the channels themselves, I mean, you want to find that balance between like you want to maintain a good user experience. Like, you know, there's a balance. You don't want to like you want to monetize your site, but you also don't want to turn into just sort of a hellish landscape of just ads that are just as terrible to use. And also, you don't want to like make it so ad dependent that you're scaring away good sellers who are just sort of like, no, I'm not going to advertise on your site. Like, who do you think you are? You want to keep a balance. And then for sellers, marketers, I mean, challenges are obvious. I mean, just figuring out where to allocate your ad budget. Like you can't do it everywhere. So which channels you want to list on, advertise on, because unfortunately it's just more and more. I mean, you still get away with listing your products and walking away, but there's going to be less and less of that. You're going to have to uh, pay to play. One of our core beliefs for years, a channel advisor, was visibility on Amazon comes down to two things, like great content and advanced advertising. But if you didn't have both of those two pillars, your products are not going to get seen. Yeah. And so soon, more and more over the year, over the next few years, that maximum is going to extend to more and more channels where if you want your product seen, you got to have really good product content and really good advertising. Yep. And to tie it back to the theme of today's talk, I mean, I would say that this is where you need to understand your customer. This is where you need to understand where your ad dollars are going to be the most effective, which, which retail and retail sites and marketplaces are going to give you that best bang for the buck. If that requires testing, so be it. But it's gotten to the point where it's time that there's no getting around it. You're going to have to pay to play. Definitely a really interesting balance of considerations, I think, for both the brands that are trying to develop their strategies and figure out how to allocate their budgets across all of these different networks, but also the retailers that are maybe developing their media models, because there is a very fine line between having this new fantastic revenue stream, right? Very important. Differentiating the business or evolving the business to another level, but also ensuring that you aren't overcrowding that experience for your customer. Because like, I know I've had cases where like, I'll search for something. Sometimes there's even a branded keyword in there. And then I get ads for similar products that are like overtaking the experience. I'm like, no, 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 but I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for this specific brand, right? Because That ultimately becomes a frustration point for the consumer and could impact whether they stay with you or whether they go somewhere else. So very fine balance. We do have a couple of more minutes. So I want to make sure we get into the content side of things because I'm a content person. Everyone who listens to this podcast knows anytime content comes up, I want to dig in a little bit further. So I do want to ask about like some of the content distinctions across all of these different, I guess, let's think about like retail media specifically. I mean, different offerings, I'm sure, different best practices. Are there any pillar best practices, pillar tips, I guess you could say, like when it comes to creating great content for retail media, for, you know, marketplaces, for instance, what kind of rises to the top for you? Like what, like, key three things maybe like do you think really need to be sound and solid for brands to ensure that that content is at least relatively up to par i mean like what kind of separates the leaders from everyone else when it comes to content well the theme we keep talking about coming back to is like you mentioned not having a dead end is one and like always like a cta front and center give them something to do next two like if you're thinking about Strong visuals, that's always going to be in style, whether that's on Amazon with uh, A-plus content, where you can sort of create and curate the brand experience that you want them to have. That is a fantastic option, and it really leads to better click-through rates. But if you're talking even something like on YouTube, yes, the visuals, yes, the CTA, but also you got to speed up your message. You have to get your, that's one of like YouTube's like best practices that they tout is like get your message in quickly <laughs> because people skip ads. And so your CTA or your kind of brand messaging needs to be like right at the beginning rather than get people's attentions because people just have like shorter and shorter attention spans and uh, people are uh, 
moving on to the next thing. So across all sites, you need to get to the point and be very clear with what your value is and what they should do next. Yeah, on that note too, even on the retail media side, I mean, I ordered the content on the marketplace side. If you're not putting in rich content and, you know, A plus content, so, you know, video content, it really needs to be a top priority because, I mean, that is, that's where the industry is now and it's table stakes. And, and I feel that the genie's not going back in that bottle. I mean, people are expecting it now. So you want to make sure that your content's engaged engaging, it's appealing, it's on brand, and that it's like you, like Bradley was saying, it's short to the point and informative. Also using the buzzword again, I mean, it has to be data driven, like everything has to like you can sit there and be creative and stuff and, and think that what you did was awesome. But you have to test every aspect of it. Does this image using people work better than this image with a dog on it? Does this headline work better than this one? Does this funny version work better than the serious version? Constant, every little aspect of it, you want to split test and, uh, and measure so you're constantly making tweaks. Yeah, and while we're speaking about content, I do want to take maybe two steps back and mention that as most brands know, that is your lifeblood, right? Your product content, your product catalog. I mean, that is, for us at least at, at Channel Advisor, one of the first things we do is we take a look at your product catalog. We got to see, is it in, which type of shape is it in? Most of the time, it needs a lot of help especially if you're talking about scaling, right? You can't even think about expanding to new platforms or new channels, new selling channels or digital marketing channels without that content in order. And I'm talking about it being comprehensive, accurate in a format that's acceptable and by the various marketplaces, because if it's not scalable, it's not doing you any good. I would also say that you need to be thinking about the individual requirements of each of these marketplaces. If they're not, if not up to specifications, you'll get kicked off. And that is a nightmare, especially for the smaller brands and smaller retailers out there. You will get kicked off if, if your content is not up to their, their specifications. So make sure you're paying attention to that, right? Make sure that it can be accepted correctly, whether it's via API, FTP or whatever. So that is something that I would highly, highly stress. And then I would also say you got to have a way to track it. OK, because you could be sending out to your retail partners, to your marketplaces. And if you don't ha if you don't know how it's performing, how well it's actually being adopted by your retailers, by your partners, it's worthless. OK, it's just you're leaving it up to luck. So I think digital shelf uh, monitoring is important. We're talking about, you know, you know knowing how a, your products are doing on a search results page on a retailer site, critical pricing. Is it accurate? Is it consistent? Is it competitive? Speaking of competitors, how is their, what does their product lineup look like? How, uh, how well are they showing up on the digital shelf? So I would say that number one, make sure your house is in order. Number two, that you're monitoring it. Yep. I'm so glad you brought up that more nitty gritty products, content and product data, you know, pricing data, all of that fundamental stuff, right? Because the creative is great, but it doesn't really serve a purpose or it doesn't deliver impact unless you have that core in place. So I'm glad you brought that up. So to close things out, gentlemen, I think we covered a lot. I think the key takeaway here is that convergence between content and commerce is getting greater as these media opportunities and these new channels evolve and expand. It's more pronounced than ever that like content is key. And I think, you know, we all can take that away and hopefully everyone listening can kind of mull that over and figure out their paths forward. But rather than tips and best practices, since that was essentially our entire conversation today, which is great, I want to ask you about predictions. Obviously, we talked about earlier that retail media isn't going away. It's going to get more robust, more retailers are going to be embracing it. But are there any other predictions about how content and media and commerce are going to continue to come together? Any any ideas of like who's going to do what or what new capabilities will come to the forefront? This is one particular area where I like getting into predictions a little bit. Well, I'd like to use this opportunity to formally apologize for being dismissive of TikTok. <laughs> I, I think that, I mean, TikTok is a great example of kind of where everything's heading. And eventually, maybe I will get an account, but not right now. Related to that, like, it's kind of also cliche that people say, if you want sort of a crystal ball of what's going to happen in 15, 20 years, like look to China, because that's has historically been sort of a glimpse into our future when it comes to e-commerce, when it comes to some of this technology over there, you know, they have these like, super apps that just do everything. They do everything on where it's like their social, it's where they buy stuff, it's where they do banking, you know, all kinds of things together. And we might not get exactly there, but I think we're there's going to be a continual blurring of the lines. And so you have like TikTok just going crazy over here and, and commerce is coming more and more. Like we're working with brands doing uh, TikTok advertising 
as well, uh, like kind of experimenting and trying to f- figure that out and try to help, help their e-commerce through TikTok. But there's going to be a lot, a continuation of kind of those lines blurring between channels and what we sometimes call um, one-handed commerce, the type of commerce you can do while holding a baby. It's kind of what we say sometimes of like, you know, just with your, with your thumb, with like bump, 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 with, with like click, click, buy. Yeah, that's going to be everywhere because back to another theme that we've been talking about the whole, like all day is um, everything is shoppable and that's just going to extend. And on that note, I, I got to get another plug in because I, I'm a huge fan of this technology, especially this industry and where it's headed and how fast it's growing. Shoppable media. I mean, oh my, I mean, the, it, I come from the agency world. If I had had this 10, 15 years ago, it would have been a game changer in terms of the way that I was helping my brands. I think that it's absolutely going to explode, especially with the incorporating local availability and dynamic linking. I think that that's going to be an area that's going to be making a lot of noise in the coming years. If you want an example of, of how well and how quickly it can adopt such technology, look no further than the alcohol industry. As soon as COVID hit, you had states relaxing regulations about how these distributors could deliver alcohol to local establishments and or directly to consumers. And we noticed right away that they they recognized the impact that Shopple Media could, could have with its local inventory availability. And the alcohol and beverage industry is absolutely crazy absolutely crushing it right now in terms of best use cases and the creative they're using, the real world applications. They are seeing absolutely no dip. In fact, they're seeing massive growth throughout, not only because people are stuck at home uh, drinking, but because of they've been able to facilitate the delivery aspect of it. And I think Shopple Media is, is going to continue to get its tentacles around other industries as well and, and make sure that you know it, it leaves its mark. Yeah, that's a great example, the alcohol one. I mean, they really, they really optimized their consumer journey because they were if anything like we're so more antiquated because of so many regulations then changed county by county state by state and the way that they have embraced shoppable technology and uh, e-commerce in the last couple of years is really it's kind of amazing so yeah it's a good closing example of like how to embrace the consumer journey really fantastic points here today greg bradley thank you again so much for taking the time out i think just given how vast the channel advisor ecosystem is you know the work that you do how you serve retailers as well as brands i mean you are the perfect duo to kind of dig into this very very large and complex topic. So thank you both so much for taking the time out to chat with me today. Alicia, it's our pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. This is fun. And to all of you, if you have any follow-up questions for Bradley and Greg, which you very likely will, we would love to hear them and continue the conversation. Drop us a line on Twitter at our touch points or on LinkedIn at Retail Touch Points. We'll be sure to tag them in the episode so you guys can continue to chat away. And of course, if you liked this episode, leave us a rating and review on your preferred podcast player. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, frankly, anywhere else. We are likely there. And of course, if you haven't already subscribed to the show, we have weekly updates, new episodes, and great conversations like this one. So when you subscribe, you will get it delivered immediately to your device. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.